my son just had to sit through a training on the stuff at his university yesterday. So it was like Zoom and a lot of it. Uh, No, I mean, the conversation we've been having about this is pretty straightforward that racism is the belief that races exist. Punto. Right. Right. Nada más. Right. I mean, and so if you believe, if you insist that race is real, which apparently more and more of the people who are coming at the likes of us as class reductionists in, insist, they're a racist, mm-hmm. right? Well, like in the literal sense, right? They um, in, insist that we treat it as, um, as, as an essentialist category right. that's rooted either in biology or culture dressed up as biology or mm-hmm. biology dressed up as culture, because they really come out to be the same, same, right. same, same thing. So it's not, and what people typically, you know, think or want to think is that <clears throat> racism is the belief that some races are better than, than others, and some should be persecuted uh, by, by those that are better. But what they have a lot of trouble wrapping their minds around is, and I've taught, taught this you know, for decades, that no, racism is the belief that there is some subspecific naturally occurring right. population within Homo sapiens that exists between the level of the species and the local breeding population. And I mean, that's, that's a part of the problem, right? Because, because there is a political economy of identity group relations, right? Uh, and it's, you know, centered largely in the cultural sector it's like all up and down the professional managerial strata uh and at this point and by this point too i mean um i've I've written this about um you know the current black political class that so 50 years after the voting rights act 50 years plus after the voting rights act you would expect that black political class after all these years of their holding the same jobs going to the same schools multi-generationally kids going to the same schools kids playing on the same traveling soccer teams, uh, having sleepovers, going to one another's weddings, marrying one another, uh, consuming the same stuff, going to the same restaurants, that they're like a single class, right? And yeah, there's like pigmentation differences in it, sort of depending on where, where you are. But what people want to see as a racial perspective on the world is is much more likely to be a class perspective, right? Uh, but the work that 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 an issue like mass incarceration does, or police violence does, and I'm not, you know, suggesting for a second that um, a Yale graduate investment banker who is black doesn't have a greater likelihood of being pushed face down on the platform at Metro North than his white, white, white classmate by a transit cop. But that, that same person doesn't have anywhere near the same chance of being jacked up in that way as somebody that lived in a zip code that George, George Floyd live, lived in. But the work that taking issues or, or like stressing issues like mass incarceration or of the police violence as as concerns that in principle at least affect all people of color or all 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 black people uh, you know the work that that focus does is basically the same uh that the focus or the insistence on analogizing inequalities or injustices in in the present to slavery and to jim crow which is that it denies the existence of political differentiation of economic differentiation of class differentiation among black people and insists on a simplistic one color frame r- race basically right I mean, one lens through through which to see everything so in that sense it's ultimately a pretty crude uh class program and the kind of frightening thing one frightening thing about the current moment and i've been thinking about this for a while and didn't want to say it out loud loud but i can count on thomas Byrne etzel to say things i wouldn't want to say out loud out, out loud uh, but in the wrong way. But from the standpoint of, you know, the capitalist class, right, or, and, or the ruling class, I've been thinking that what appeals to them about this identitarian moment is that it, it can offer a way to rescue something that looks like um, a democratic 
ne neoliberalism, that, that is a small d, in a context in which it may be as the combination of the Sanders insurgencies and the Trump, Trump insurgency showed, that uh, the neoliberal political economy, it may be exhausting its uh, capacities for delivering enough stuff to enough people to be able to keep functioning as a democracy. And I mean, we see what's happened like in other states that have gotten to that point, Brazil, Bolivia, I mean, mm. Hungary, India, uh, Poland, um, et, et cetera. I mean, I would toss Boris Johnson in there too, just for the heck of it. So what I was thinking was that, okay, well then if we can, if they can help consolidate, um, you know, the idea that the only serious um, and morally defensible norm for social justice is anti-disparitarianism, right? Or pursuit of equality, a real equality of opportunity in market capitalism, then they can keep the thing going for, for a while. But the dirty thought underneath that is that, you know, as Ed Saul and Michael Lind and Joel Kotkin and pe people like that are always gonna look for, that this attention that's being lavished, right, on the colors, as it were, fuels um, counter mobilization among the authoritarian right uh, and I thought, okay, well, maybe, you know, that could be a problem that, that the real ruling class figures they can handle. But on the other hand, like, it might be that that works out pretty well for them too, right? Uh, and um, this is a way that I've been toying with the notion that anti-racism now may come to perform the, um, a version of the same kind of function that racism performed uh, for the first half or two-thirds of the 20th century, depending on where you were in the U.S., well, I mean, the difference between liberals and conservatives, right, about broke black people and brown people and white people, for that matter, is that the liberals say, well, they're broke through reasons that don't have to do with their own in intrinsic, or no, not they're broke, excuse me. Yes, they're broke, but they're fucked up for reasons that don't have to do with their own intrinsic failings, but they're victims and in principle, maybe kind of weak because they couldn't stand up to it or didn't have the skills or whatever, whatever. Where the conservatives say, no, they're just terrible. But, but, but they both agree on the terrible part, right? And that they're a problem to be administered, right? Um, they can't be trusted to take care of themselves. They don't really deserve a, a decent standard of living, right? For, for whatever reason. We've been living now for however you want to count it, in a sort of bipart under a bipartisan neo a bipartisan neoliberal consensus that was formed and consolidated somewhere between Reagan, the elder Bush, and Clinton, and it might be that the Obama presidency was the last hurrah for that version of, of democratic small d again ne neoliberalism. Uh, but like now, I mean, God knows what 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 the other side of the pandemic's going to be, but I'm starting to feel now that 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 the ruling class um, or the people that count, right, the opinion leaders, as political scientists would call them, have decided to weigh in and to put their thumbs thumbs on the scales in ways that are um, characteristically left in form and right in essence, right. So, like the race relations stuff, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I'm not naive about the functions of neo of neoliberal police like you know the first time i saw the battle of algiers in a movie theater i thought shit i've been in this movie right i mean <laughs> and and when my son got swept up by a black cop with a jerry curl uh when he was 15 in in new haven connecticut on the way home uh from high school once i subsided blowing my top when i found out about it a little bit i said to him well I guess you just had your black bar mitzvah, right? So it, it's, it's like, tough, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. So I'm not naive about that, but I also understand that most black people, <clears throat> most of the time, and I mean, most working class black people, don't wake up first thing in the morning thinking about the cops. They're thinking about stuff like jobs, housing, healthcare, um, schools, I mean, how are they gonna pay for it? How are they gonna get it? You know, whatever, whatever. But, but the issues, like you know abstract moral 
issue like police reform as an abstraction, defunding the police at, as an abstraction, breaking police unions slash public sector unions as a concrete proposal mm. works out very nicely for them, right? Uh, and it also changes the topic. And you can feel the long hand of the Ford Foundation and the leadership development and community development corporations and like shaping the institutional structure of uh, a political economy of race relations administration that sort of moves in a slightly different direction, farther away from anything that smells like class re class re redistribution. First is the class versus race debate. Wh which one is it? And then when, and then we respond by saying, well, that's a simplistic debate because uh, of, of, of a variety of reasons we can talk about later if you want, I don't know. But, but like then this kind of funny position started to pop up around DSA and like other um, younger leftist groups or whatever uh, calls, uh, well, it's been satirized by its opponents as bo both andism, right? That it's like race, race and class. And say, yeah, okay, well, that's great, fine. So what does that mean exactly? But then the next move is, all right, so Katie, I'm sure is, is, is pro probably implicated like at the heart of this, but so like Sanders gets, um, castigated as a cl class reductionist because he talks about the working class. And one of the rhetorical moves here is that working class gets re redefined as white. So you can't be black and be in a working class, even though statistically speaking, not to be a prude about this, uh, you're more likely to be in a working class if you're black than if you're white, right? I mean, just, just, yeah. just given who does what, what for a living and like the distribution of jobs. But you can't be. So you can either be black or working class. You can't be both. And to me, like, that's, first of all, a testament of the extent to which the black upper class and, and a professional managerial strata have won in defining what's publicly understood to be the domain of black, black political aspiration. Hmm. Right. Hmm. Uh, Joy, Joy Ann Reed is kind of a pet of mine, like in this regard. Right. Uh, in fact, just just before I hit the Zoom link, right, I I checked her annual salary and her net worth uh, because I just happened to see her on um, on a Daily Show in 2017, ragging on Bernie and explaining about how black people don't really care about stuff like Medicare for all or 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 free college or universally re redistributive programs, but they want stuff like the, they want to have the racial conversation and to have the reckoning about America's past. And I thought, gee, I wonder what black people she's been talking to. Mm. And then I double checked and saw she's a Harvard graduate. She makes, she made them like a million and a half dollars a year and had a net worth of 4 million. So I'm pretty sure that the black circles that she runs in don't include a lot of people who would say, oh, wow, I can go to Penn State for free. As my friend Walter Ben Michaels has said, the best way you can, um, or the best evidence uh, that somebody has a class position is that they deny it they have one. Mm -hmm. Right. right. Uh, and that's how this thing works, right? So you dress what's a class position up in racial garb. And isn't that what nationalism always was, right? I mean, to begin with, right? Um, so then you get to denounce you know, anybody who has a different class position as a, who, or who's advocating for a different class perspective as a cl class reductionist. When, when what gets constituted as the racial agenda is pretty clearly a class agenda, right? Mm. Um, what is the racial wealth gap, for God's sake, right? I mean, that's, what, I mean, that's not something that's going to dribble down as far as me, you know what I mean? I mean, it's what um, you rectify the racial wealth gap right. by um, creating black investment banking houses, right? That's what the story is. But it's all within commitment to uh, market criteria uh, or tying a notion and, and, and any notion, even just the imagination of a just world it has to be tied to, to presumptions of a market society. Preston Smith, the second, is a political scientist, uh, did a great book called Racial Democracy in the Black Metropolis. 
that's a study of post-war housing policy in Chicago, uh, formulated a number of years ago the notion that, that there have been two contending principles mar or norms at, that, that, that drove black American political activity in, in the middle decades of the 20th century, from the 30s through, through the 60s. One he defines as the principle of racial democracy, which is basically that, right? I mean, it's, it's the idea that, that, that the society will be ra racially just, as one preacher back in the Black Power era put it, if black people are 12% of the ditch diggers and 12% of the corporate boards, right? right. And 12% of everything in between. The other, which emerged in black politics out of the Great Migration and the CIO and A. Philip Randolph and, and the emergence of a bl uh, black mass politics is a social democratic ideal. And through the 30s and 40s and, and 50s and into the 60s during a period when there's a kind of a black popular front, uh, I mean leftism uh, was dominant, the two kind of rode together and converged and diverged sometimes around parallel, but uh, I, I mean, sometimes they were in conflict. And I think um, a simple way to, to understand what's happened over the last 55 years after the Voting Rights Act is that um, the racial democratic impulse, which was the one class's impulse, crushed the other one, right? Or sort of ate the twin in the womb or whatever, right? But, uh, <laughs> The problem is, you know, we didn't um, elect our way into this situation and we're not going to elect our way out of it. And we have to finally act like a left that understands organizing as being something different from event planning, right? Like I gave a talk at a steelworkers local in Georgetown, South, South Carolina. And uh, there, there are these two white, white rank and filers. One of them is just a dunderhead, right? He's... He's an old guy who, who, who had two ideas that had gotten into his head and the sutures closed around him. One was bring back the, uh, the manufacturing jobs, and the other was get, 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 rid of the, get rid of the immigrants. But the other guy was, was more complex, and he said to me, you know, like, I like Sanders' economic program, right? And he said, but the, the thing I don't understand is why the Democrats let themselves get caught caught up in all the moral issues, like as he referred to them. And I assume he meant stuff like same-sex marriage and feminism and abortion, whatever. So we talked around it or talked about it. And you know, I didn't know him before, but I'm sure that somebody who had standing with him because I at least you know stopped him for a couple seconds. But, but when I asked him, well, so which is more, you know, one way to think about this is which is more important to you, that you have you know um, access to health care that's guaranteed and of high quality and, and a good wage, or that no two same sex people could ever marry, right? And, and that stopped him for a minute. And I think somebody that he had a real relationship with could work on him and especially like if you analogize it to the union i said because i said to him too look at there's probably somebody in your shift you can't stand his guts and you can't wait to clock out so you don't have to see him again until the next time you clock in but i bet you that with that person on union matters you were able to find find a way to work together right and so that's the kind of solidarity that we need to try to build with people and and look some some percentage of people who are committed to you know the moral issues are going to be committed to them and we can't do anything about it and we won't win that but there are enough people and we had a pretty significant experience of this kind of thing on our own in the founding of the labor party that some some people are going to be willing to swallow uh their personal preferences right uh for pursuit of a collective goal and that's the culture that we want to build and that's the kind of movement that we want to build and that's the exact opposite of this disposition to treat the movement like it's a threat right like you got to show that mm. you accept all the principles and know all the right 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 words